in the year 541 AD, a ship arrived on the shores of Constantinople. This ship along with its crew carried grain and other goods which was supposed to be paid as a tribute to King Justinian, Lord of the Byzantine Empire. However, little did the crew on board know that a pack of plague-carrying rats had also hitched a ride with them from Egypt. As the plague infected sailors started interacting with the local population, the virus began to spread. The plague, which would later be known as the Plague of Justinian, ravaged the city, which at its peak recorded over 10,000 deaths in a single day. Due to its contagious nature, the plague soon spread across Europe, Asia, North Africa and Arabia, killing a hundred million people in its wake, half the world's population at the time. Fast forward to 1347, when Black Death hit Europe, claiming over 200 million lives in just four years. It continued to wreak havoc in the continent every 10 years or so for another 300 years till 1665, killing 20% of the population each time. Similarly, in the 15th century, smallpox eradicated 95% of the Aztec and America's Red Indian indigenous population. Just after the end of World War I, Spanish flu killed 20 to 50 million people, including lakhs in Mumbai. The point here is pandemics are nothing new. We've been facing them for many centuries now. What's changed is the way we deal with them. The plague of Justinian only stopped when there was no one left to kill. Even the Emperor Justinian died because of it. Europe's Black Death was defeated by adopting self-isolation and quarantine methods. In the mid-1700s in Bengal, India, British doctor J. Z. Howell first observed a rudimentary practice of immunization used extensively since the mid-16th century. The variola or scabs of smallpox infected victims were ground into powder and rubbed into superficial cuts made into the skin of healthy people in the hope that a mild infection would result and subside after a few weeks without causing severe illness, a practice known as variolation. But the tide truly turned 30 years later, when in 1796, a British doctor Edward Jenner used a weakened version of the smallpox virus and created the world's first vaccine. In the 20th century alone, we've discovered vaccines for fatally infectious diseases like pertussis, diphtheria, tetanus, polio, measles and rubella. These vaccines were so effective that a disease like polio literally vanished from the face of the earth. But in those days, the smallpox vaccine was not made in factories. It was made in people. You got a poke in your arm and after about a week, a pustule formed at the spot. The doctor withdrew the pus from it, which was the vaccine, and inoculated others with it. The British first tried to bring the smallpox vaccine to India in 1800 via a human chain or arm-to-arm -arm supply, inoculating one person at a time for the duration of the journey so that a harvestable postule would be available when the ship reached Bombay. But the experiment failed. However, two years later, the arm-to-arm -arm experiment succeeded when a ship sailing from Basra reached Bombay carrying a live sample on June 14, 1802, when three-year-old Anna Dusthall, daughter of a British servant, became the first person to be vaccinated against smallpox on Indian soil. Pus from her arm was used to vaccinate five other children and slowly, by 1807, more than a million people in India were vaccinated. Over the years, as knowledge has grown and technology becomes more efficient, we've gotten better and faster at finding and manufacturing vaccines. In fact, some optimists are brazen enough to predict this could very well be the world's last major pandemic. Presently, however, the normal timeline for vaccine development is still around 4 to 5 years, though in this case, it's likely to be much faster. The one good thing about COVID-19 is that it's 80% related to SARS and MERS, on which we already have a ton of research and don't need to start from scratch. With the help of computer simulations, within months, we have already found a way to detect and treat, though not cure, the disease. Getting a vaccine ready is a bit more complicated. Normally, for any novel virus, the quest for a vaccine would go through a pre-clinical phase where it would be tested on humans and or animal cells to make sure it isn't actively dangerous. If it passes this test, it enters human trials which are conducted in three phases. Phase 1 testing a mild dose on the vaccine on 50 or so healthy volunteers. Phase 2, the dosage strength and number of volunteers is increased to hundreds. And Phase 3 involves tens of thousands of people given the maximum tolerated dose. 
The Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine is in human trials with over 50,000 people in the US, UK, India, Brazil and South Africa. So as to include more varying ethnicities and groups like the elderly or people with pre-existing conditions whose immune systems might operate differently. But reaching phase 3 trials in record time required some innovation. For example, in Oxford AstraZeneca's Human Challenge trial, the virus is being intentionally injected into volunteers to test the efficacy of the vaccine. Normally, in a phase 3 trial, participants are injected with either a vaccine or a placebo, a saline solution that doesn't contain any medicine, basically salt water. Known as a double-blind trial because neither the volunteer nor the doctor knows who is getting the vaccine and who is getting the placebo. They are then encouraged to go about and resume their normal lives. During this time, if any of them come in contact with the virus, the efficiency of the vaccine is tested. However, in the Oxford AstraZeneca trial, most of the participants are young and healthy enough to combat the virus on their own anyway. So how it will work on the elderly or those with comorbidities that is having other problems like hypertension, asthma, diabetes, we may know only after the vaccine is out. At present, it seems any vaccine will do. And even the FDA looks desperate. The vaccine needs to work only 50% of the time for it to be approved. But will that be enough to control the pandemic? Since frontline healthcare workers like doctors, nurses, welfare workers, cops and the elderly will be the first to get the vaccine, Assuming only 6 out of 10 people are inoculated in 2021, it needs to work 80% of the time to control the pandemic. If it works only 70% of the time, then more people would need to be vaccinated, as the spread will only slow, it won't stop. Pfizer's vaccine at a promised 90% efficacy is a better outcome than what was hoped. As of now, there are 178 COVID-19 vaccines in development, out of which 27 are in the human trial phase, 11 of which are in phase 3. All of them are developing the vaccine using one of five basic techniques. 18, including Sinovac, are using the disabled virus method that has worked successfully with SARC, polio, MMR and rabies. 77, like Sanofi, GlaxoSmithKline, are using not the whole virus but the spike protein structures of the virus like used in vaccines for shingles and HPV. 44, like AstraZeneca and Johnson & Johnson, are using the Trojan horse method, putting one virus into the cell of another virus. Using a weakened common cold adenovirus, they are loading it with SARS-CoV-2 spike protein to get a response from the immune system, also known as viral vector method. 16 like Inovio are using snippets of the coronavirus spike protein's DNA code to alert the immune system called DNA plasmid method, while 23 like Pfizer and BioNTech are using the same method but with RNA instead of DNA. First successfully done by Moderna Therapeutics that readied a vaccine for human testing in 42 days, a process that normally takes years. Typically, while making a vaccine, manufacturers grow massive amounts of the virus in a lab, then disable them so that they can't cause disease but are still potent enough for the immune system to learn how to fight them. An RNA vaccine is different because it does not contain the actual virus in weakened or disabled form, just the RNA strand code that is specific for that disease. However, no RNA vaccine has ever been approved for human use so far. While leading the race is Oxford, AstraZeneca and Pfizer, Russia's Sputnik approved its vaccine after trials involving just 76 people, as did the Chinese companies CanSino Biologics and Sinovac Biotech even before completing phase 3 trials. Neither the Russians, Chinese or the US are part of Gavi, a global alliance of more than 170 countries whose aim is to ensure that all countries get the vaccine, irrespective of how rich or poor they are. Some wealthy countries, however, are pre-buying large stocks of vaccine to cover their population many times over, leaving developing countries down the queue. India's prowess as a pharmaceutical powerhouse has seen many global pharma companies approach them for manufacturing. Dr. Reddy is with Russia's Sputnik V vaccine, Bharat Biotech with Corona Flu, UK's Oxford and Sweden-based AstraZeneca with Serum Institute and SK Biosciences, Biological E with Johnson & Johnson and Indian Immunologicals. Other Indian companies are in the process of developing a vaccine of their own. Bharat Biotech's Covaxin and Zydus Cadillac's Zycovid-D have both successfully entered human phase trials while Genova Biopharmaceuticals plans to join them soon. However, just because a vaccine has been developed, manufacturing it without contamination in large numbers poses its own challenges. 
even as development is being fast tracked there still remains a big issue of logistics and distribution of a vaccine that needs it to be kept at below 0 degrees to remain effective vaccines made using rna including pfizer's require to be stored at between minus 20 to minus 70 degrees centigrade to last up to 6 months this is far below india's capability of standard refrigeration of plus 2 to 8 degrees celsius where the vaccine will last for just 5 days which means we may lose out even if the vaccine is available and india's 1.3 billion people may take up to 2024 to have each one vaccinated remember a vaccine for polio was discovered in 1955 but it was only eradicated in india 60 years later in 2014 also considering that all vaccines developed so far are intravenous one will need to go to a medical facility to get it administered this raises other challenges of having sufficient beds and refrigerators not to mention continuous power supply and training enough people to safely inject the vaccine then there is the cost to deal with serums and bharat biotech will require two doses while cadela's vaccine requires three though vaccines developed in india may be cheaper if 20% of the population 260 million people get the vaccine in the first year that cost alone will be 11000 crore at cost of syringes glass vials transportation storage administration and the total cost may well cross 20000 crore for the hiv aids virus we neither have a vaccine nor a cure after 40 years though the disease can be controlled however 2021 will surely see not one but many vaccines and in billions of dosages till then stay safe wear a mask and quarantine as much as possible bizbos limerick the race for a vaccine is entering a critical phase trials are going on at a searing pace the spike protein and the virus's gene is being neutralized to save the human race subscribe to bizbo and click on the bell icon to get notified whenever bizbo releases a new video sources of all our information is listed in the video description section